Okay. So here we are. We're going to be talking at first about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how are um, horizontal asymptotes really used? I mean, what do you do with them? Well, this is what we do with them. We have this, we have this function right here. Let's go ahead and color that in. All right, so here we have n of t equals 0 0.8 t plus 1100 over 2t plus 6. It also says t is equal to or greater than 15. t is time. And so it's telling us we have to start at t equals 15 minutes or 15 seconds, 15 hours, whatever the time is, however it's measured in this problem. All right, and this ugly looking function right here gives the body concentration N of T. So N of T right here, that's, that means or stands for the concentration in the body of a drug in parts per million of a certain dosage of medication after time t in hours. Okay, so they're not interested in the concentration right away or the concentration after 10 hours or 11 hours. They want to start at 15 hours and build from there. Why? Because that's what the researcher wants to do. No other reason. Now they're asking us, what does N of T approach as T goes to infinity? We have to talk about that, what that means. And B, it, we have to explain the meaning of the answer in part A. Well, we're gonna do that too. All right, so let's look at this again. We have, we have this function right here. And we're going to start using it at, at t equals 15 hours or after. And what this does is <clears throat> it gives the body concentration in parts per million of a certain dosage of medication after time in hours. That's an important issue. How much of this drug is left after a certain amount of time. Well, we're just being asked two things, okay? Just looking at this as a rational function, and yesterday what we did was we, um, we analyzed rational functions, so we're going to analyze this. 0 0.8 t plus 1100 over 2t plus 6. Well, we talked about the domain, but it's not asking for the domain. In fact, if we were going to find the domain, 2t plus 6 equals 0, we would find that 2t equals negative 6 and divide by 2, we would find that, okay, t cannot be allowed to equal negative 3. Negative 3 hours, what would that be? That would be 3 hours before we're even interested in measuring. And besides, you can't use negative hours. So, no, this makes no sense. t always begins at 0, always. Now here we're beginning at 15, but if we hadn't had those instructions right here, we would have started at zero. 
we don't start at negative time. So we don't even need to worry about the domain. Instead, what we need to do is look what happens after, after time. For instance, suppose, let's say 15 hours. What is the body concentration at 15 hours? Well, N of T, that would be N of 15, equals 0 0.8 times 15 plus 1100 over 2 times 15 plus 6. Let's go ahead and find out what those are. I'm going to calculate the numerator and the denominator separately. I'm just curious. Inquiring minds want to know. So 0 0.8 times 15 plus 1100. Enter. It's 1112. All right, so let's look at a fraction like this, 1,112 over, well, I, I don't need a calculator for this, 2 times 15 is 30, plus 6 is 36. I wonder what that would be, divided by 36. We're talking about parts per million, if we were to round that to whole parts, that would be 31 parts per million after 15 hours. 31 parts per million. Well, let's, let's go to some extra time here. Let's say, uh, how about 25 hours? 10 more hours n of 25 equals 0 0.8 times 25 plus 1100 over uh, 2 times 25 plus 6. Well, that's going to be 56 on the bottom. So let's see what this is on top. 0 0.8 times 25 plus 1100. It's 1120. So let's see what that is. Um, all right, so 1,120 divided by 56 is 20. So, I mean, we know just from experience, um, drugs tend to, you know, you urinate them out for the most part or do something else to them out. But, but the concentration continues to get lower and lower and lower over time. So by 25 hours, we're at 20 parts per million. Exactly. Well, of course, it's still all non-exact, but near 20 parts per million. OK, so now what they're asking is, what does N of T approach as T goes to infinity? What does T goes to infinity mean? All this really means is as T gets larger and larger, which is what we did here. We started at 15 hours, then we moved on up to 25 hours, we could move to 26 hours. We could move to 30 hours. We could do all of that. We could say, okay, T keeps getting bigger. T keeps getting big.
bigger. So we're asking after a whole lot of hours, what would be a good estimate for the concentration in the body? Does it go to zero? What would it go to? Well, we're going to use what we learned yesterday about horizontal asymptotes. So we have this function, n of t, where t starts at 15, then 16, then 17, and so on. And we have zero point, that's a zero, believe it or not, 0 0.8 t plus 1100 over 2t plus 16. All right, now we want to find the horizontal asymptote because that is the tendency over time. So to find the ha, we look at the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom, the degree of the numerator, the degree of the denominator. This is the leading term, the highest degree term of the numerator, and the degree of that term is one. This is the highest degree term of the denominator, and the degree of 2t is one, because t is to the power one. So we have degree one, on top and degree one on the bottom. We have a rule. We have a rule about that. Let's write our leading uh, our leading terms. 0 0.8 t over 2 t. Now, if we were just working with a regular fraction, we would even cancel out the t's cancel, cancel, and be left with 0 0.8 divided by 2. What is that going to be? It's going to be 0 0.4. Let's make sure. 0 0.8 divided by 2 is 0.4. So, 0 0.4, that is If we were graphing this, woo, wiggle, wiggle. If that is the wiggly x-axis, which wouldn't really be wiggly, then 0 0.4 is y equals 0 0.4, and it would be really close to, but not touching, the x-axis. And whatever the graph looks like, it would be coming down, right? And we know that graphs tend to approach the horizontal asymptote over time. So it would be getting closer and closer and closer to y equals 0 0.4. Now let me point out here that n of t is the same kind of animal or measurement as f of x. And both of them are the same thing as y. So n of t, in other words, the graph, which is declining, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time goes by, n of t is going to approach, and this means approach, 0 0.4. Notice, and this might cause you some um, worry maybe, 
if you were taking this drug, that even after millions and millions and millions and millions of hours, and you probably wouldn't even live that long, um, the concentration in your body is never going to go completely away. It's going to be really, really small. But if they, if if an archaeologist digs up your your body, a million a million years. Let's not do that. A hundred years from now, they'll still find some of this medication in your body. Yep. So I've taken care of A and B, actually. I've said, what N of T approaches as T goes to infinity, which means T isn't going to go to infinity. T is going to get really big. So when you see approach, what does N of T approach as T goes to infinity? Think to yourself, as T gets really big. As T gets really, really, really big. Because infinity is really, really big. OK, and what does that mean? Well, we talked about what that means. When the archaeologist digs you up, you're still going to have some of this medication in your body. Which, for instance, you've watched crime dramas. When somebody gets poisoned, maybe 20 years later, the police get a tip saying, my mother didn't die of natural causes. Somebody poisoned her. And so they dig up the body and they do an autopsy on what's left. And sure enough, they find arsenic maybe in the body after all that time. 20 years, 30 years. Sure enough, there's arsenic in the body. The old lady was murdered. Who did it? And so we get to watch a crime drama on television or watch a true crime podcast. I love true crime podcasts. That's hard to say. Plural is hard to say. OK, that's what the horizontal asymptote is in real life. It is the tendency. Now let's look at another one. We're going to be dealing with another kind of tendency. The population P in thousands of a resort community is given by this function. And they're starting at T equals zero, which is more, more normal. Here's a look at the graph. Initially, in the beginning, they're starting from almost zero, I guess. And then uh, it's a resort community. You're gonna take your family there, right? Probably in the summer. Or maybe it's a ski community. You're gonna take your family there in the winter whatever, but all of a sudden the population starts to grow incredibly fast. And then as the season progresses, people go home. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Well, here I've talked about the meaning again. The horizontal asymptote will tell you about how many people are left at the end of the season. Let's find out. Oh, first, we're going to say find the population at T equals zero. T equals zero means zero time. OK, so P, oops, no, no, here, we'll do it here. P of zero means when the time is zero. In other words, in the beginning, P, P of zero 
when t equals zero, means in the beginning. We're going to use that again at the end of the semester. End. Beginning. Okay, in the beginning, let's check it out. We're going to have 400 times zero over two times zero squared. And I just want to tell anyone who's going to take calculus, we don't really deal with zero squared. We just consider it zero plus seven. Well, 400 times zero is zero. Two times zero is zero over seven. Well, zero over seven is just zero. So P of zero, when T equals zero, is zero or almost zero. I assume there are one or two people there to keep the place clean, caretakers. But we don't have to bring reality into this too much. We'll just say the population is zero in the beginning. Then, as the season progresses, we'll have P of 1, and then we'll find P of 2, and then we'll find P of 3, and it might be nice to find out what that is. Where T is time in months. Okay, so T is in months. So, after one month, we're going to have 400 times 1, over 2 times 1 squared plus 7. That'll be 400. 1 squared is 1, so 2 times 1 is 2, plus 7 is 9. I don't know what that is. Let's, let's get an approximation. 400, whoop, not 4,000. I go backwards and then I hit the delete key, and it's like I never made a mistake. I'll find another one to make though. Divided by nine. 4.4444444. So that would round to 44. There are about 44 people, which would be, let's see, this would be 50. So after one month, you would be about there. After one month. Now, after two months, oh, let's say that's about 44. Okay, and it doesn't say that the population, oh, the population is in thousands. Excuse me. It jumps from zero to 44,000. Or if you multiply that by a thousand, you would have 44,444. Let's go for that. 44,444. And how I got that was to multiply 1,000 by 44.444. Okay, let's try two. After two months, we'll have 400 times two over two times two squared plus seven That'll be 800 over 2 times 4 is 8 plus seven, uh, 2 squared is 4. And then 2 times 4 is 8 plus 7 is 15. So let's check out 800 over 15. That's 53.3333333. 53, but having learned 
53.333. And of course, there are other threes after it, but that three will not cause that three to round up. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to multiply by a thousand because the population is in thousands. And what that will give me will be 1,000 times 53.333, which will give me 53,333. Wow! Well, look at that. I bet that's about there. I bet it is. After two months, you've got 53,333 people going down your slopes. You better have a traffic director. Let's find out what it is after three months. See, I'm assuming it's a ski lodge. Probably because it's definitely fall out there. There are leaves blowing. It's so sad. All right, 400 times three over two times three squared plus seven. Well, four times three is 12. So this will be 1200 over now, this is two times nine plus seven. That'll be 18 plus seven, which is 25. So I'll have 25 down here. 1,200 divided by 25. 1,200 divided by 25. is 48. Oh, it's starting to go down again. Well, we knew it would at some point. 48. Oh, and it's even. So 48.000. And if I multiply that by 1,000, that'll be 48,000. OK. So now we can see it's starting to decline. 48,000 would probably be about there. So now we're on the downward swing. So let's see what some of the other questions are. OK, find the horizontal asymptote of the graph and determine the value that P of T approaches as t goes to infinity. In other words, as time passes, as the months pass, the snow melts, it becomes spring. Let's find out. Let's look up here. The degree of the numerator is one. How do I know? Because this is t to the one power. So the degree of the numerator degree one. The degree of the denominator is two because T is to the two power. This is the other rule for horizontal asymptotes. When the degree of the bottom is higher than the degree of the top, or what we like to say is when the degree of the numerator is lower than the degree of the denominator, Your ha is y equals zero, which is the x-axis. So everybody's going to go home when the snow melts. So as t goes to infinity, which of course just means as time goes by, or as a lot of time goes by, um, your uh, P of T is going to approach zero. Now again, close to zero, because we assume, I certainly assume, 
that they're going to have cleaning staff come in ever so often and they'll probably have a caretaker on site. OK, so in real life situations, you can call on your experience too, to guess, you know, make a good guess about, well, after a whole lot of time passes, people are going to leave the resort and go back to their daily lives. Does any of that make sense? I hope it does. OK. So much for horizontal asymptotes. Now we're going to use something that you can use in your daily life. I don't have a swimming pool, but maybe you do. Or maybe you'll work at a place that has a swimming pool or live at a place that has a swimming pool. A swimming pool can be filled, so let's draw it. It's always good to make a picture. Even if you can't draw, just don't tell anybody. I mean, I'm the teacher, I have to tell somebody. But they don't have to see your drawings. There you go, there's your pool. A swimming pool can be filled in 14 hours if the water enters through a pipe alone. So let's let this be the pipe over on oop, oop, over on the side of the pool. So if you've got water coming through the pipe, your pool will be filled in 14 hours. That's what T equals. OK, now suppose. You have a break in your pipe. So suppose you have to depend on. Your garden hose, for goodness sake. What a total bummer that would be. But how many of us have to depend on our garden hoses? I do actually when I fill up the bird bath. They get a pool. I don't get a pool. It's going to take 23 hours. To fill your pool. With your garden hose. Bummer. OK, well, the question is, what if you use them both together at the same time? How long will it take? There's a formula. There's a formula for that. One over A plus one over B equals one over C. That's one way of writing it. There's another way of writing it as well. C, well, let me explain how this happens. If you decide to multiply both sides of this equation by C, then what you would do is you would distribute the C in here and here, and you would multiply the C in here so that what you would have would be C over A plus C over B equals C over C, and that's one. C over C is one. So another way that this formula can be written is C over A plus C over B equals one.
and you're free to do it either way you want. But what the heck are A and B? And C for that matter. Okay, so we'll talk about this. What is A, what is B, and what is C? And we'll use this as an example. All right, the time it takes the pipe to fill the pool. That we could let that be A. We know what it is. But let's think about the formula right now. That would be A, and I'm going to let A equal 14, 14 hours. Now, of course, you can tell B is going to be the time it takes the garden hose. So the time it takes the hose to fill the pool is going to be B, and that'll be 23. Now what is C? C is the time it takes pipe and hose to fill the pool. That is C, and we don't know what it is. That's what we're trying to find out. All right, let's do it. C over A plus C over B equals one. So C over 14 plus C over 23 equals one. Now this is a rational equation. An easy way to get rid of the fractions is to multiply both sides of this equation by 14 times 23. Let's do it. I'm not even going to bother to multiply them together. Not yet. So 14 times 23 times C over 14 plus C over 23 equals one times 14 times 23. And then I distribute this in. And that will give me, actually, yeah, I put numbers in front of letters, don't I? That's the, the, <clears throat> the well thought of way to do it. So 14 times 23 times C over 14 See, I'm going to be able to cancel. 14 times 23 times C over 23 equals 1 times 14 times 23. So I suppose I'm going to have to find out what that is. 14 times 23 is 322. So over here, the 14s cancel. Over here, the 23s cancel. And what I'm going to end up with is 23C plus 14C equals 322. 
Well, let's see, three plus four is seven. Two plus one is three. 37 C equals 322. And I divide both sides by 37 and by 37. And so, C will equal, I'm going to math frac and see if that helps. I don't think it'll work. 322, right? 322, I didn't have to write it again, but oh well. Divided by 37, enter. Now, it's about 8.7, but let me show you the kind of answer they want, okay? They want us to answer, and this is almost, ne this almost never happens in algebra. The people who created this problem want us to answer in a mixed fraction. Now let me, let me pull out the detached LCD. Notice what I got when I divided 322 by 37. I got 8.702702, and then the reason that's a three is you've got this, this bank of 702 repeating, and the seven that would follow the two there rounded it up to a three. Well, what we're going to do, all right, what I'm going to do, is kind of drag this down a little bit, and I'm going to write down the eight, the whole number part, the eight. There I go. Now, uh -huh, uh -huh. there it is, okay. Now I'm going to subtract off the eight and what will happen is I just have the decimal part. Minus eight. Now this really goes on forever. I don't want to interrupt that. So I am not going to write 0 0.702, 0 0 0.702, 702, 702, 7. That'll ruin it. I need to keep everything that's in the brain the very large brain of this little calculator. OK, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to math frack. All of this going on forever. Or however the calculator approximates forever. So now I'm going to math. Frack. Enter. 26, oh, excuse me. 26 over 37. Now that's not bad, really. Hours. The pipe takes 14 hours, the hose takes 23 hours. But when you put them together, it's only going to take a little over eight hours to fill your pool. Shoot, if you started it in the morning, it would be ready when the kids get home from school. Or if it's summertime, maybe they're not in school. But whatever. That's how you do this problem. One of, well, C over A plus C over B equals one, or 
1 over A plus 1 over B equals 1 over C. Your choice, whichever one you want to use. But whenever you have, th these are called, let, let me categorize this for you. This is called a work problem because work is being done. This formula is used by store managers to say, okay, I have two, work I have two workers and, <clears throat> and one can get a particular job done in one time and another takes a little bit longer because he's newer. But what about if I put them both together? How much time would it take them? And you can compare. You can even decide which workers could be put together to do a job and take the least amount of time. So you can actually use this stuff. Now, finally, a rate times distance problem. Remember rate times distance or distance equals rate times time. I like to call it distance equals rate times time because if you put an E for the equals, you get dirt. Misspelled, but you get dirt. It's a dirt problem. That's a good way to remember it. The distance you go is going to equal your rate of speed times your time of travel. That's one of the most important formulas in, in the universe. So let's look at this story problem, this word problem about a plane. A plane flies 22,340 miles with the wind, and that means the wind is behind it, pushing it. So let's draw a little picture. I'm not real good at drawing planes, but could be worse. I really don't have to go to this much trouble. With the plane, when the plane goes with the wind, the wind is making it go faster because you've got the motors, you've got the jets, right? You've got the jets making the plane go, but then the wind give it a little extra boost. So when this plane is going with the wind, it travels 2,340 miles. Now it says in the same time, in the same amount of time. So these guys are both going to go at for T hours. How about that? In the same amount of time, it can fly 2060, 2060 miles. These are miles, so that's distance. So this is distance. It can travel 2060 miles in the same amount of time. Um, going against the wind. So now the wind is going to be slowing down the plane. The wind hasn't changed directions. The plane has changed directions. So I'm better making my planes go the other way. Okay, so there's our jet. Roar! See, it's, it's a lousy plane this time. But the wind is going to slow it down, so that's why it can go fewer miles. It's going the same speed. Now it says the cruising speed, 
the speed of the motors is 550 miles per hour. So that's going to be true no matter what. So the plane by itself would go at 550 miles per hour. 550 miles per hour. So we're being asked to find the speed of the wind. They're not telling us how fast the wind is going. That'll make the wind angry. Ooh. Might get a hurricane on our hands. Or a tornado. I wouldn't want to piss off the wind. Uh-uh. Okay, so what do I do with all this information? Ah, the best way to deal with a lot of information at one time is to make a table like this. Distance equals rate times time. So 2340 equals the rate of speed, now we're going to talk about that in a minute, times the time of travel. Now we know that the times are exactly the same. Because of the magic words in here, I'm going to color the magic words. In the same amount of time. So let's read it again, knowing that in the same amount of time means in the same amount of time. A plane travels 2,340 miles per hour with the wind behind it. In the same amount of time, it can travel 2,060 miles against the wind. The cruising speed of the plane is 550 miles per hour. What is the speed of the wind? Okay. The times are going, <laughs> I did it again. The times are going to be exactly the same. That's what it said. The rates, oop, 2060. The rates are going to be different. If I'm traveling with the wind, then how fast my plane is actually going is not just 550 miles per hour, that's the speed of the motors. The wind is adding to it. So 550 plus W is the, the rate of speed of the plane when it's traveling with the wind. When the plane is going against the wind, the motors are still going 550 miles per hour, but the wind is dragging on the plane, making it go slower. So 550 minus W is the rate of speed of the plane against the wind. And so we now have a system of equations. We have 2340 equals 550 plus W times T. And 2060 equals 550 minus W times T. 
where the T's are exactly equal. Now here's the strategy. The T's are exactly equal. We need something that's exactly equal. So what I need to do is solve for T up here and solve for T down here. Let's do that. And I think I left myself an extra page thinking that something like that would probably happen. 2340 equals parentheses 550 plus W close parentheses times T. If I want to solve for T and I do, then I'll divide both sides by parentheses 550 plus W. parentheses 550 plus W. These cancel over here, leaving me with T equals 2340 over 550 plus W. And this is the T with the wind. I'm going to let this be with the wind. Because it doesn't matter, they're the same. The times are in this word problem. And against the wind. Sounds like the Bob Seeger song, Against the Wind. So this over here will be 2340 over 550 plus W, and I want to keep my parentheses, just makes it less confusing. And then we've got an equal sign. And now I'm going to solve for T against the wind. So that'll be 2060 equals parentheses 550 minus W times T. And to solve for T, I have to divide both sides by 550 minus W. 550 minus W. Parentheses 550 minus W. These cancel out over here, leaving me with T equals 2060 over 550 minus W. Ta-da! Now I bring that over here and up here 2060 over 2060 over 550 minus W. This is an equation that I'm going to solve. Now this could look really hard. It looks really hard, but, but there, there's a trick. We talked about this the other day when we were solving rational equations. <coughs> when you have one fraction equals one fraction, that's the easiest kind of fraction problem to solve because it's really a proportion. One fraction equals one fraction is a proportion. So all you have to do is cross multiply. That's what I'm going to do in a different color. What color? What color? 
How about blue? I'm going to multiply Well, I don't need an arrow for that. Everything moves around. Good grief. There. OK, and then I'm going to multiply this way. So that what I will have is. 2340. times 550 minus W equals 2060 times 550 plus W. And all I have to do is solve that. And it could be worse. It could be. There's a way we could make it a little better, but it might also make it more confusing, so let's not. I mean, we could. No, don't say it. Trying to use some self-control here. It's not easy. OK, I need to take this and move it down there. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take a picture and move it, put it down here. Make it a little smaller. There. Now, what am I going to do? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Yes, is somebody there? No, OK. I need to scroll down and it's giving me trouble. There, OK. There. I'm going to, I'm going to do this kind of long. 2340 times 550. Minus 2340 times W. I distributed 2340 to both terms. Now what that's going to equal, I'm going to do the same thing here. 2060 times 550 plus 2060 times W. All right, now it's time for the calculator. Wake up calculator. Okay, I'm gonna say 2340 times 550. 2340, uh, no, 2340 times 550. Yuck. It's 1,287,000. Minus 2340W. Equals. 2060 times 550, so 2060 times 550. Ah, look at that. It's all right, I'll just delete it. Delete the proof. 2060 times 550. 1,187,000. One million, one hundred thirty three thousand plus twenty sixty W. 
Now at this point, I could easily divide out some big numbers. But again, let's just do it the straightforward way and get it over with. I hate big numbers. All right, I'm going to add 2340 W to both sides. Over here, they cancel out, leaving me with 1, 2, 8, 7, 0, 0, 0. You'd be surprised how easy it is to lose zeros or add zeros that don't belong there. 1, 1, 3, 3, 0, 0, 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 0, 6 plus 4 is 10, 1 plus 3 is 4, 2 plus 2 is 4. So 4400 W. Then I'm going to subtract 1, 1, 3, 3, 0, 0, 0 minus 1, 1, 3, 3, 0, 0, 0. Those zero out. I, should, I shouldn't have said canceled out here, they zero out. That I'm left with 4,400 times W. And over here, zero minus zero is zero, zero minus zero is zero, zero minus zero is zero, seven minus three is four, eight minus three is five, two minus one is one, and one minus one is zero. So to solve for the speed of the wind, I divide both sides by 4,400. Goodness gravy. So the wind is 1, 5, 4, 0, 0, 0, divided by 4,400. Enter. Ah, 35 miles per hour. Huh. That's pretty good. I wonder who thought that one up and what it took to get a nice round number. You're going to see more probably, there are a lot, I've seen a lot anyway, of these in the same amount of time as. Okay, and they always have the same exact strategy. You saw because the T's are equal. You solve for the T's and take what the T's equal and set those equal together. Now, what have we done for you? We have shown you the value of horizontal asymptotes in real life. Whether you're a medical person or whether you run a ski resort or any kind of resort. 
and how to get workers together and how to get pipes together, whatever, how to find the pair that will or, or the group of things that will do a job in a most efficient, quickest manner. And that's got a formula. Two formulas. And you can take your pick because they're actually equal. And then we've got you set up to be a pilot. Or maybe somebody who works at, at an airport or with airplanes. Your whole future is set before you now. You should be grateful. OK, I hope this helps you do your homework. This is the end of week six. We begin week seven on Monday, and the following Monday is test two. So one of my jobs this weekend is to start, well, to finish preparing the practice exam and then the real exam. I make the practice exam first, and then I make the real exam from the practice exam. And what goes into the practice exam is your homework problems. So that's the whole story right there. And my kitty agrees. This is Bubba. Yeah, he agrees. So I'll see you guys on Monday. I'm going to go back to doing grades. You'll be glad to know that I did not have to remove anyone in your class. I feel very happy that people who, a few people who were very far behind seemed to get their act together and do some work last night. So thank you everybody. You saved me a lot of, a lot of stress. Talk to you later, bye bye. Bubba and I say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bubba wants you all to go away so I can feed him his lunch. See you later.